Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal, Exposing the Mysteries of Executive Function. I'm your host, Sucheta Kamath. I believe by trying to find solutions uh, in neuroscience and psychology and education, we can all accomplish everyday transformations. And these transformations is what allows us to grow uh, personally and collectively. As you know, I've shared this with you all many times. This podcast is fueled with three particular goals. One is to explain what executive function is, how crucial it is to our personal development, self-sufficiency, and even moral development. Second is to help motivate uh, the current self (laughs) to invest uh, time and effort in and become the confidant that the future self needs to take care of itself. And lastly, to help people create some sort of playbook Uh, a blueprint, um, so to speak, so that we can really accomplish the goals we have for ourselves. And as you know, I always am uh, bringing you guests that uh, hold some sort of key to unlock this mystery. And with that, you will be very thrilled to know who my guest is, which is Dr. Susan Engel. But before I introduce you uh, to her, I wanted to share a quick story from my childhood. When I was younger, uh, I've shared this before, I grew up in India, but I was a voracious reader. I I loved to read. And um, in in Indian, I I speak five languages, you know, Indian, Indian, uh, there are many epics, uh, so to speak, uh, that um, as a child growing up in India, I'm familiar with and I have read in my mother tongue, so to speak, or in our national language. Uh, but one particular epic that was very popular uh, when I was a teen, and that was called Kese Hatim Tai, which is the translated loosely translated as the tale of Hatim Tai. And um, the protagonist of that story was Hatim, who goes on adventures. Um, and it, it's told over seven episodes or seven adventures, so to speak. So the story goes that, you know, there's a king who falls in love with this beautiful rich and a maiden woman called Hasun, uh, Husnabanu, and uh, he wishes to marry her, but she has a condition that in order to marry her, he must solve seven riddles. And however, the king, um, I don't know if it was dumb or not, but was not able to solve the riddles. So he um, reaches out to this very generous man, Hatim Tai, who undertakes the quest to find answers to these seven questions. And these seven questions, the search for these, and these are very big questions, you know, questions such as, do no evil. If you do, such shall you meet with. Mm. The second question is, what I saw once, I long for a second time. So what the reason I'm telling you this story is this was one of my first uh, distinct memories of getting introduced to ideas of creative ways of thinking about the world Mm. and mysteries in the world and exploring minds of others. You know, how people live lives that you do not have access to is one of the things that the books did for me. And this part is probably one of the reasons why I find that everyday life for me is full of creativity, inquisitiveness, curiosity, and a self-created adventure. So with that in mind, uh, my guest today is Dr. Susan Engel. Uh, She's a senior lecturer in psychology and founding director of the program in teaching at Williams College. She's a co-founder of an experimental school in New York State, where she was the educational advisor for 18 years. Her research interests include the development of narrative, curiosity, and invention. Her current research examines how children pursue ideas. Her scholarly work has Uh, appeared in journals such as Cognitive Development, Harvard Educational Review, and the American Educational uh, Research Journal. She's highly accomplished, amazing human. You will get to know soon. Uh, But you can also find a lot of her writing in New York Times, Bloomberg Review, View, The Nation, The Atlantic Monthly, Salon, etc., etc. She has written multiple books, uh, three of 
my my favorite books. But the book we will concentrate on today is going to be uh, talking about um, the curiosity uh, and how uh, the book we'll be talking about the intellectual lives of children. So with that, uh, welcome to the podcast, Susan. How are you today? Fine, and thank you so much for that nice introduction. I love uh, the story so, about your childhood. I love. Oh, the, thank you. Read, yeah. I, 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 your book actually got me thinking about what were the influ influential questions I was thinking about mm. at that age. I mean, this is a little bit later. Um, uh, and my mom lives with me, so I did ask her what kind of questions um, I asked of oh. her. And also, you know, you write about a, um, a little bit, maybe you can share with our audience about your childhood, how you grew up and the freedom you had to uh, you know, bike to a local store and just explore and, and navigate relationship. I had a similar experience, um, but a lot of my creative endeavors were, were related to cooking uh -huh. and observing cooking yeah. as a culture. Yeah. So one quick example, I've, I've talked about this a lot and people might think I'm a freak, but when I was, um, you know, I was growing up in India and we have something called papadums. I don't know if you know I what do. papadums are, right? These are very dry. Yes. So, but you make them o uh, over the summer and you it takes whole summer to dry them. Wow. And then you store them and then you use it throughout the year. And one of the job that children are designated to do is to watch the papadums like a hawk, mm. um, watch them dry. It is as boring and annoying as watching paint dry. Yeah. But it and this happens during the summer over the rooftop in the hottest sun possible. And you need the papadums to have the exposure to sun but you need to be in the shade, but there's no shade. So this leads to a lot of chaos and amazing fun games that you play. So my brothers and I, we used to do a lot of sitting and idle, idle game playing. So I was just wondering this particular experience kind of, I vividly related to your question about the um, intellectual lives of children. One thing is so interesting that, you know, um, parents and teachers miss uh, to view children as thinkers mm -hmm. and someone uh, whose mind is pondering about life. And uh, you talk a lot about that. I, I think people are often view children as someone with blank slate yeah. or an empty jar needing to yeah. be filled, yeah. uh, like a hands working on a, but, but the brain is rather hands working with the Play-Doh. So tell us how you conceptualize creativity in children or the thinking minds of children. Right. Okay. So I was going to say right away, um, I actually, in my work, don't focus much on creativity. And there's a reason why I don't. Uh, it's because that word tends to be used in our culture to describe people as if you are creative or you're not. And in schools, it tends to be relegated to certain activities, hmm. art or theater or free time. And to me, uh, the, the dual processes of curiosity or inquiry and invention, putting things together, solving problems, um, they're not, they're not, they shouldn't be relegated to art time or free time. Uh, it's not as if some people have that capacity and other people don't, certainly not in childhood. So I like to stick to the words inquiry and invention because those are active processes that anybody can engage in. Anybody can, lift up a rock and see what's crawling around underneath it hmm. or ask a question about why the papadums take all summer to dry or uh, the, the riddles, the answers to those riddles, which I could barely follow. But those, the kind of inquiry that any of those puzzles lead to is available to anybody. Hmm. And, um, and certainly when, uh, when people are young between the, between birth and certainly the age of four or five, Almost everybody does engage in inquiry. Everybody wants to find things out. Uh, they want to find out who's coming in the door and what's under the couch and what an unexpected food tastes like and what's going to happen if you push the boat down to the bottom of the bathtub. I mean, there are a million things to find out when you're little. Um, so that's the inquiry part of it. And same with invention. If, you know, by the time you're an adult, only some people are truly inventive. And we tend to think in the United States of invention as being the the capacity of a certain great minds. But everybody's an inventor when they're three because mm. everybody figures out a way to put stack the pillows up. It's an example I give in the book uh, to get up on the counter and get the cookie out of the cookie jar. And every three-year-old 
invents a game. You know, you were talking about the games you created with your um, brothers. Every three and four year old invents games, how to throw the stones so that they, uh, you know, make a funny noise and, and who's going to be this superhero and who's going to be the villain. Um, every, every, almost every three and four year old can and does engage in the invention of stories. Um, I asked my, I, I told you before, I, I teach a course on education and I'm t- tomorrow's the first meeting of this semester. And I was asking one of my sons who's 34 and a dad himself. Now I was asking him w- about some wonderful memories of, of early schooling, things that really made him just zoom ahead. And he said, first he said the milk carton, uh, what did he say? The milk carton popping contest we had every Friday. Well, I never heard about that. In third grade, they <laughs> drank their milk out of the little cartons, and then they all smashed on them to see who could pop it the loudest. Oh, but so cute. And it was really cute. And then he paused. He said, and then after that, we went in and we got out all the milk crates, and we built forts with them. And I loved building those forts. Well, Building forts is a great example of a process of invention that almost every child engages in, no matter what materials or objects they have around them. So that's long-winded answer. But, um, well, let me end that by just to go back to your question. That all ties together to say that, you know, children do have very rich intellectual lives. And grown-ups tend not to notice all the buzzing sort of, lively thinking that's going on and some I I would say that even people who pay a lot of attention to kids people who love their children who think kids are really cute or um, active and lively they may miss the fact that just under the surface every child is pursuing various ideas mulling things over contemplating sort of important questions or questions that are important to them and they're not always obvious questions, and the the process of pursuing those questions is not always apparent uh, to the casual glance. So many important things you said uh, that that totally reverberate with me. I think first, I am so happy to know the distinction uh, that you put out right away, which is the distinction between um, you know this uh, creativity versus curiosity, inquiry, and invention. Yeah. I do think that I cannot tell you how many times I hear adults say so emphatically that they are not creative. Exactly. And one, not only it's it's wrong way of framing your life's experience, but two, I think uh, to me, every single aspect of living a fulfilling life requires you to solve a problem. Exactly. And you have to be inventive and creative and you need to have a sense of inquiry about it. I um, mean, look, I would say this. By that every child inquires and invents, but not every older person does. Um, I, I absolutely. And so it's not as if, because if we were all inventive and solving problems in in ingenious and um, in ingenious ways all the time, there would be no need really to study this or understand it. It would be great. We do it. Um, the the fact is. To, to, for various reasons, um, some better reasons than others, um, many people sort of give up on that process of invention as they get older, just as many people become less curious as they get older. Every two-year-old is curious. Virtually every typically developing uh, two-year-old is um, curious. Let's, let's limit it to that. But um, but not every 18-year-old is curious, and certainly not every 30-year-old is curious. And, and I just invite anybody listening to go into a room full of people you know. It could be your family. It could be your colleagues. And listen to who is really asking questions, probing, um, daring to not know something out loud. Uh, there, there are plenty of people who have lost that capacity by the time they grow up. So... It, it and that's not inevitable. That's not. Mm. It's not as if we're all. You know, some things like I'm just not as physically energetic as when I was young, and that's inevitable. I think for most people, not my mom. She's 97. She's very energetic, but for most of us, that's inevitable. That kind of development, but losing your energy and interest and capacity to inquire and invent 
and invent those, that's not an inevitable loss. That has to do to some degree with our educational system. And with that uh, in mind, you know, I think you know, the biggest uh, curious person I have known all my life is my mom, oh, just like yours. Nice. She, and not only she is incredibly curious, she's 79 and she lives with me, but she's incredibly inventive or oh. she inquires her, her world. And I'll give you a quick example. When we were growing up, we uh, lived in a neighborhood where we had a swimming pool. Um, but my mother grew up uh, in a very rural part, uh, in a, comes from a very modest or poor family. And she um, learned to swim in a river. Mm. So she would take all three of us to the river and she would, now mind you, this is a woman who wears sari, so she's not wearing bathing suit or anything. She would take a, 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 can, a tin can, a large tin a can, uh, steal it, and then she would uh, poke holes on each side, put a rope through it, <gasps> tie it around her, and jump from a very high rock oh into my the river. God. That's the greatest story. And and she would jump, and then we would follow suit. And so she created, you know, for uh, my younger brother, who was younger, a smaller uh, can. And so just to watch her invent this yeah. little, uh, you know, gadget for right. swimming, right. Uh, a, a floaty, basically. Fantastic story. Uh, yeah. And, and so then you take, like, everything around the house. You know, she... Um, I mean, one of the big things in India, at least, um, I don't know if you follow, so I'll, I mean, I'll find out and send you a video, but, you know, um, living in a frugal and modest way and being really mindful of your resources is a big thing for, for Indian families who are living together. So you take a toothpaste, okay? And when the toothpaste is over, about to be over, but not fully over, there would be 100,000 ways to get squeezed out the last <laughs> bit of toothpaste, Great. right? Right. Isn't yeah. that like amazing, inventive well, ways? The thing that's this great story. The thing that's so interesting about that um, is that it's true. You know, it's this old um, cliche that necessity is the mother of invention. I, I once wrote a piece for a magazine, in, I think made in England called Eon. And I think I called, um, I think I called the article Invention's Other Mother. And it's because I was talking about curiosity being the other mother. I love that. It's because necessity is one, can be one spur to invention, like with your mom and the, the floaties. But a lot of people might need a solution and they don't feel mentally flexible enough or uh, with enough mental resources to come up with the solution. So uh, necessity is one part of it, but so is a kind of a, a sense, well, part of it is a sense that you can. So hmm. for whatever reason, your mom uh, felt that she could solve problems. And, you know, I see this in, in at the college level all the time. I, I work with the brightest students in the world. I mean, I adore them and they're incredibly smart and they tend to have done very well in high school or they wouldn't be at Williams. But, um, but not all of them feel they're good at learning other people's ideas, but they don't all feel that they mm. can come up with their own. And it's true that uh, when you get to the, it's one thing to invent a, a game or a Ford or a way to pop the milk carton. Once your inventions are intellectual, once you're developing ideas, it takes, you know, a lot of work. It's not a one-off. It's not like an idea pops into your head and that's the end of it. Um, you know, if you look at um, a book I love by Michael Lewis called The Undoing Project. I love that book. Yeah, yes. such a great book about Kahneman and Tversky's development of their, their research um, as social psychologists. It took them years and endless tinkering and research and conversations to come up with the idea they had. Or to use an example um, from um, my newest book, Anthony uh, Greenwald. Uh, who developed the idea of um, unconscious bias and the use of um, the IAT, the implicit app, what is it called? Uh, implicit association yep. test. Association test. Measure yeah. people's unconscious bias. That took them a long time to develop that idea. It wasn't just the technique that took time. It, it was it was the effort 
to think, well, what's right about this idea? What's wrong about it? What would somebody else say if they heard the idea? What are the situations it doesn't apply to? Under what conditions would this idea fall apart? And that process, so the way that I like to think about it or, or sometimes talk about it is that you have to build an idea. You don't just build a fort or a <laughs> floaty. You have to build an idea. And so kids sort of over time lose not only the sense that they can, that they're entitled to have their own ideas, but they don't get the help they need. A lot of them too often, not always, but too often, they don't get the help they need learning how to do that. Like it's not just that three-year-olds can do it. And if we just let them be, they'd go on doing it. It is something you need guidance. You need role models. You need practice, huge amount of practice. Um, and that could come from school if we if we wanted it to. That could be the thing you could learn how to do in school, build an idea. But we just, we haven't oriented ourselves towards that. And what was so clear in in uh, in the way you describe it also is, one, I think this requires a, a true, genuine understanding of distinction between learning content and idea, other people's ideas versus becoming very good at and skillfully um, nurturing ideas. Yes. And, and these ideas are plenty and then they go through editorial process, yes. but this is a self editing process, not other editing. So I see a lot of, uh, like, I mean, what I mean by other editing is very prematurely parents say, this is a good idea. Oh, why see. don't you now, you know what I mean? Yeah. Why don't you now, why don't you enter a competition? <laughs> well, no, this is something I want to like, this conversation just happened this morning with a friend who, um, noticed uh, her son is now into magic uh -huh. and everything is about magic. And she said he has stopped watching TV shows unless they're magic shows, uh -huh. you know? Uh -huh. So this is a very early, amazing interest, curiosity. Now that can, if he's playing magic cards, now this can really be picked up by an adult and saying, oh, you're really looking talented in this area. Let's now make it a craft. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. You know, it's so interesting because... So this year, I'm doing some new research with a former student of mine, Whitney Sanford, who's a, a lab director in, 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 a, in a research lab in Boston. But she and I are pursuing her thesis research, which was wonderful research on the conditions under which four-year-olds invent. But now the new research is looking at the questions that young children pursue over time. Um, and... Uh, I, I can't say too much about it because we're right in the middle of looking at the data. And we're very excited by it. But one thing I would say that goes with what you just said is that, you know, this idea that everything a child, every interest a child has must suddenly be a great talent or go to a contest or be in a show or whatever is antithetical to true intellectual pursuit. And all you have to do is like look at our data kids get interested in, in really important, weighty, complex intellectual topics. Um, the nature of infinity or uh, what happens after you die or um, how, what extinction, what the process of extinction really is. It's amazing what they, the questions they raise that you can find out about if you just poke. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they truly mull these things over over a course of weeks and months. So it's not as if they just do something, it's wonderful, talented, cool, and that's the end of it. And no one's paying attention uh, enough to these questions to try to get them to be in a contest for them or, you know, make it, get a lot of attention for it. And I suppose the silver lining to that is that children really have a chance to mull them over these questions in their own way. Uh, you know, you could pay attention just by listening to their questions and talking to them about the ideas they're interested in. But uh, it's sort of the opposite of of suddenly making it into a big deal. I'm, I'm going to kind of combine two thoughts that came. One is, uh, you know, I, I would describe that I have really, um, really inculcated my mother's uh, incredible curiosity and inquiry and desire to invent. And, and in, in, I don't know if you have heard the term Jugad. Have you heard no, of the term no. or science about Jugad? No, These no, two MIT pro, uh, professors have written about it. And it's, it's actually a creative, 
a problem solving process uh-huh. in very common in Indian culture. Uh-huh. And they have actually scientifically studied, uh, um, which is shortcuts, effective, most effective shortcuts. Uh-huh. And, and in growing up in India, one of the things, and as you said, mother of invention, um, either always having, you know, shortage of ac- access to stuff. So then you have to be very mindful of resources and repurpose them. And, but secondly, also becoming very efficient with, uh, so that you can do things without wasting resource or time because both are high price commodities, so right. to speak. And, and when, uh, but it's so infused in the household. So it's not just parents are doing and the kids are oblivious to it. So you're watching how, like, for example, my grandmother, now, this is so funny, but uh, so my, gra- uh, like I said, my, my grandparents lived next to a river. There was no running water. So she would have to carry, um, you know, these uh, containers, uh, which is called matka on uh, and bring them like instead of buckets, you put them on your head. Yeah. Uh, you, you roll up a sari, put it on your head. And then on top of it, you carry it. Mm-hmm. It's a very common thing. Uh, and I've seen my grandmother do it when we were younger. And so now you're carrying three um, on top of each other, wow. stacked up. So now that requires incredible balance. It mm-hmm. requires, but then how, once you have stacked them, how do you t- carry two more buckets? So you need to figure out like incredible balance. So many things go into it, right? Yeah. So now when you, once you bring the water, you have to now unload it. Now that requires another s- whole load of strategies, right? Yeah. And Watching this again and again, um, you become very mindful of if I want to carry seven bags of groceries, then ca- what is the most effective way of carrying groceries? Like I remember doing a little demonstration to my kid when he was 10, how to compact the garbage bag yeah. and accommodate more garbage in it, which yeah. I thought because it was, I see so many garbage bags, like half full and people throw the garbage bag yeah. and not compacting their yeah. trash. Now, People may think it's a utter waste of life, but it's a priority, you know, yeah. to me and my husband. So I'm just thinking huh. when we talk, is there a role of culture that plays in right. the way we think about needing to constantly be mindful of new ways of doing so that we are effective or useful or impactful on our Well, I guess I would say two things that are going to sound kind of opposite. <laughs> um, one <laughs> is... Your story is a reminder, and and actually there's such wonderful research on this, you know, that one of the things about human beings is they learn from each other, and um, they are very savvy at learning from what elders have to teach them. Um, In fact, there's this phrase, over-imitation. You know, they imitate what other people are doing in order to learn what the culture has to teach them. So, for instance, in your story about the water, you could imagine that for in some communities it would be better to learn how your how other people have carried the water so that you could save your mental energy for inventing something that hasn't yet been invented and so that mm. that's complicated that's a that's a big topic um that invites would it, should invite a lot of research which is how do people decide when to invent and when to learn from others mm. um and the reason it's so interesting is, of course, you can't invent without having a lot of knowledge. You talked about this earlier in our conversation. Too often, in at least in U.S. conversations about education, you hear this false sort of um, polarization. You either have to learn facts or you can just think your own thoughts and be creative and come up with things. And I, I hate that way of framing it because... No one ever invented anything if they didn't already have some facts. Most inventions, certainly when we're talking about the invention of an idea, require the input of a lot of people. There's not a scientist working today who isn't building their scientific work on on the shoulders of previous scientific work. So, So we're always learning from others. And I suppose you could frame this a little differently, you could say one of the cool questions to ask is how do kids learn when they should learn from others and when they should try to come up with something of their own? Oh, brilliant. Yeah. And and so um, when you ask about the cultural piece, one part has to do with 
learning information and skills from other people so that you can invent and so that you can decide when invention is the, the right way to go. But there's another piece, I think, that was more where you were actually going with it, which is the culture of invention itself. And you're talking about households, your household, for instance, where it, people valued the process of coming up with a better way of doing something. I would push that even further because mostly I'd push it this way because this is what I'm interested in my research. Um, I'm very interested in the culture of valuing ideas. And mm. so you can listen. And again, I invite anybody who watches your podcast now to pay attention to this. Do grownups talk to children about ideas? I, I give an example in my book. Um, the person I told the story about wouldn't allow me to, to use his name um, because he's too modest, but it's a wonderful story of a young father who, when I, I was that. telling this dad about how interesting it is, the way in which children show such an interest in death. And this little girl said to her dad, what happens to people when they die? And this dad, who's a very thoughtful person, said a lot of different people have different ideas about that. And then he went on to tell her a few of the ideas. So in some families or communities, you will hear, if you listen carefully, a lot of talk about ideas themselves. That's a good idea, or that's an interesting idea. Let's think about that. Or, well, what did you mean when you said that? I wonder if that would work. And it slips by. It's very natural, that kind of talk. To the people who do it a lot, it's very natural. Um, but there are other households where people don't do that, where they don't say, oh, that's an interesting idea, or, well, that's one idea about it, but here's another idea about it. Um, mm. And so along with the kind of culture of invention that you experienced, I would add that there's um, there's variation in whether there's a culture of inventing ideas or paying attention to ideas. After all, you know, all the cool things that children invent and that some grown-ups invent that are physical, for every one of those is an idea that you can't put your hands around. It's an, it's purely intellectual, but every bit is powerful. I'll give you one because I talk about it in the book and I'm obsessed with it. Um, the idea of capitalism. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, there's this incredible article by Stephen Metcalf called The Idea That Swallowed the World. Uh, some ideas are so big that once they get in our heads, we can't think outside of them. And I don't say that to to um, praise or condemn capitalism. I'll stay out of that for this podcast. But to point out that ideas are every bit as powerful and important, e even the purely intellectual ones, as, you know, garbage compressors and airplanes and... Um, floaty devices and white out an example I give in my book of a very cool invention. Um, so one thing I would just to go back is that some, you know, children, I think are affected by whether they're around people who value ideas and that goes for teachers as well as, um, mm. as parents. Yeah. I think the, uh, interesting thing about uh, these, uh, you know, the book Sapien in that way yeah. kind of maps the trajectory of how human culture got shaped by newer ideas, right? When we started thinking about religion, right? Uh, the, or rather had a label of some unseen power that governs um, the way nature works, and we can't decipher it. So we're going to call, you know, or think that God is operational here mm -hmm. or then capitalism and then nation and boundaries. Yeah. Those are all very complex ideas of right. how, you know, what makes a boundary of a nation, right? Yeah. Right. Great. Great. Uh, <laughs> and, and I was thinking about in my, uh, like I, I because of I'm multilingual, some of the things I was thinking about, I can't offhand think about the word idea or a synonym for idea in my mother tongue. Really? But we have, uh, we say vichar, which means thought. Ah. And so there's a, um, and uh, vichara shakti, which actually means the strength to think. Oh. And and so it's interesting that idea as an innovation is, um, or inventing is not a separate, it's cultivating this strength to think. Um, oh, interesting. I did not know that. And, and so I was just wondering that, you know, uh, if we can 
talk about this vichara shakti, this strength mm-hmm. to think. So reading plays such an important role in creating experiences for children where yeah. uh, they get to visit place, people yeah. and places and landscapes that yeah. um, that is somewhat not physically sometimes possible to visit. Yeah. So how does reading, reading influence cultivation of uh, this curiosity? What a super great question. And it goes back to your first story about the book you loved when you were a kid, because you said it allowed you into these, I, I don't know if you said lives of these other people, but the thing of that's amazing about reading is it allows you into somebody else's mind. Yes. Uh, so there's the lives of the characters, but if you read enough, you begin to think about the mind of the writer. And and you might also think about the mind of the characters. I mean, both. Um, so, uh, you know, reading, well, how how will I answer that? I mean, first of all, for I was a voracious reader, too, like you. Were you? Yeah, oh, my God. I, think, I told this story in my book about curiosity, about lying, asking to be excused from the table every night so I could go in the other room. And the two things I liked to do from the living room, so it was connected to the kitchen. They weren't separate rooms. I liked to lie on the couch, and there were two things I loved to do. One was to read, like, let me back to my book, please. And the other was <laughs> to got, listen to their gossip, the grown-ups' gossip. Yes. Um, and I, I talk about that in my curiosity book. I think gossip is the single most underappreciated form of curiosity in the world. And I say that because I'm such an avid gossip. And if you love fiction, which I do, of course you love gossip. Like you can't really separate those two things. Um, but so one reason it's so important is it, it feeds you all this information. It might be like in this book, um, The Intellectual Lives of Children, you know, if you looked at it, I start off talking about loving these books about movie stars when I was little. I yes. just didn't get enough of Marilyn Monroe and Greta Garbo and Clark Gable. And it was very salacious, my curiosity. But it also allowed me to develop some expertise. And I got granted expertise about what? About these sort of weird lives that, that they were living. But it gave me a taste of what expertise was like. Because, and we know from research, and this is true in childhood, um, that expertise matters as much as age, as development. So M- Micheline Shi in her work shows that a child who knows a lot about dinosaurs organizes them at an intellectually higher level, the dinosaurs, than a kid who doesn't know about dinosaurs or chess pieces, as another example. Um, and so... If you're a kid who loves to read, you have a chance to develop expertise in any number of topics. It could be movie stars. It could be trucks. It could be the lives of people in Mumbai. I mean, it could be any number of topics uh, or ways of thinking about the topics. So, So that's one thing. Of course, there is research that suggests that the process of reading allows you to engage in a certain kind of analytic thought that you can't get without reading. And uh, so literacy confers a lot of intellectual benefits on people. Um, but I just even if you don't get that far in, in thinking about it, if one doesn't, the stuff you get through reading is, is such uh, is food for a, a hungry mind. And um, and on top of all of that, it allows you to enter other people's minds. And that's such an important. So so. You know, the building of ideas is a very social process, which we were talking about before. And, and that's another reason why reading is such a, a powerful piece of this. You know, it just the gossip piece that you just <laughs> said. No wonder I love these uh, amazing, you know, stories. I'm getting ready to interview uh, Jonathan Gottschall, uh-huh. who's the, uh, the uh, you know, storytelling animal, author of uh, Storytelling Animal. But I think this idea that if you think about the role gossip plays um in social regulation right totally to to gossip is to actually be able to uh, observe behaviors of others and whether they are using some uh you know failing in moral discretion or not and by also talking about somebody's behaviors you are kind of saying where your moral compass lies absolutely right by criticizing that I do not permit myself doing that. <laughs> right. Absolutely. You know, there's some great old research. I, I feel so terrible. I can't remember her name right now. He said, she said. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I wrote about it. In the, it's cited in the book. But anyway, about young children using gossip 
to uh, transmit to each other in the schoolyard or, you know, on the school bus, uh, social norms. I mean, they do it too. And one of the most fun things to do is to go into schools, as I've done a lot, and listen to various ways that children express curiosity. And they express curiosity about any men or any, any range of topics. They're, you know, huge range. But a lot of kids love to find out what the other kid is doing. Did they get in trouble? Did they throw up? Yes. <laughs> you know, did they get a big present for their birthday? Did they break up with their best friend over lunch? And so forth and so on. So that, that impulse starts very early in life. Um, and we shouldn't underrate it is all I want to say. <laughs> and, you know, um, uh, in, in the population that I work with, with uh, children with um, autism spectrum disorder, this is a, a genuine difficulty. Yes. And two things I see happen. One is they are not interested in the gossip when the gossip comes their way, yeah. and which becomes quite a, a defeat defeated purpose, the person yeah. who's gossiping because yeah. it's not reciprocated with. Yeah. And so because they're not benefiting from this knowledge of other people's behaviors who have other minds and ideas and thinking. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they do not observe others to pick up on gossip worthy details. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I always tell this funny story about um, my husband who is my opposite in so many ways. Um, he's quiet. I'm a blabbermouth. Um, and he, you know, we're good at different things. We like to do different things, but we'll go to a party and we'll come home and I'll be talking only about everybody's subtle little mean glances and who was being friendly to whom and who had seemed to create too much distance with another person, blah, blah, blah. He's bored to death by that. And then he'll tell me about the flooring or the <laughs> called the shade of paint that the windowsill was um, had on it. And we're just, we're, the, we're looking at different worlds. Um, and he, I have to say he's a good gossiper, but, uh, but he's picking up on a different level of reality when we go out. <laughs> different level of reality. That's yeah. pretty, I wonder if that's also gender difference. You know, I, I see the same mm -hmm. thing with my husband. Mm -hmm. I always used to accuse him that you're not providing me with enough juicy material. Exactly. <laughs> about our social encounter. Yeah, exactly. Come on. Exactly. I, I'm building my capital on this. <laughs> You're not helping. <laughs> so another question I have is I had a young 15 year old once, you know, who introduced me to this idea called six degrees of wiki. Do you know what that is? No. <laughs> so it is like, uh, you know, he used to say you start with a one wiki page and in six moves, uh, you connect back to the original wiki, oh. which is silly, but very innovative way of thinking. You Yes, there's. Weird. It's labor of love. It's executive function process of regulating your thinking to connect that. Huh? So I'm curious, can exploring the internet huh? be considered the same as exploring the physical world? Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> the million dollar question that no one can avoid anymore. Um, well, I'm going to have a very unsatisfying answer for that. So, you know, uh, here I'm not speaking about evidence. I'm just giving you an educated hunch. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't think anything replaces the physical world. And I agree certainly with you. when you're young, I mean, I have two grandchildren who are two, one's two and one's two and a half, and nothing can replace the physical world when you're, when you're young. I don't think anything can replace the physical world when you're 62, my age either. But, um, but I also think, well, I think two things. I, I, I wouldn't be too disparaging of the internet because I do think there it is a way to satisfy your curiosity. I think that story about Wiki is interesting because actually there's some very cool um, marketing research actually, but I think they were psychologists working in a marketing department about <laughs> the way in which people go online and some people are hunters and other people are, there's another word for it, like razors or gatherers. I mean, really? I know the phrase is gathering, but in that context, I don't know if it's grazing or gathering. And and so the hunter, I'm a bit of a hunter. Um, I get a question in my mind. I, I got to stick with it. And I go deeper and deeper, but I've got to get the answer to my original question. Other people graze. They go from one topic to another. And, oh, look, Henry VIII was married to Queen Elizabeth. Oh, now I want to know about Queen Elizabeth. Oh, now I want to know about the Tudor, whatever. Mm. Um, and... I have no opinion on which is better. I don't think anybody knows, but they they both are ways to satisfy curiosity. 
Um, and so I, I don't know that that's, I don't know that that's bad. I don't think we have enough evidence yet to know mm. bad or good. I will say two more things about that. One is very often, and I'm guilty of this as well, you get, you go online and you're not actually satisfying either kind of curiosity, the hunting kind or the gathering kind. You're just kind of, it's sort of like giving yourself little tastes of sugar or something. It's just, <laughs> it's very distracting. It's very quick. It's very superficial. By the time I'm done doing it, I've forgotten what the first thing was I looked at. I don't think that's too good for kids. Um, and I think there's some evidence that it's not too good for kids. That's a different process. Uh, but to end that question on, or that answer on a, on, a, on a better note, you know, the thing about curiosity is like, like appetite itself, it has to be fed to continue. If you don't eat long enough, you lose mm. your appetite. And the only time it's really good to feel hungry is when you know you're going to eat. And the same is true of curiosity. It's good to have your curiosity fed. And some of the time, the internet is a great way for kids to do that. They really want to know something and how cool that they can find it out. No, no adult can give them the answer. It's something that they can't learn through physical experience. Um, it's something about the past or something about the invisible world of unseen things. And it's better to feed your curiosity at least some of the time or it, you know, it withers up and, and dries. Um, just like actual appetite. Uh, so that's a kind of wishy-washy answer because I don't think we know yet. And finally, I'll just say, w whatever the answer is, it's not going away. The internet is yes. going away. So, <laughs> so true. <laughs> if there are ways to get kids to engage with it in, in, that are good, great. I hope we learn those ways. But it's not as if children are going to grow up without the internet starting now. I think you know what's so interesting uh, um, about that, which I I really appreciate your answer about that uh, the relationship of curiosity needing to be fed for it to build on itself, uh, because yeah. then you will go either deep or high, whichever yeah. way you want to conceptualize. But I do think if you uh, the other piece that you often talk about is this curiosity, inquiry, and invention. I don't know if that may lead to invention. Uh, necessarily, because I think one thing I feel in my work, particularly since I work exclusively with children who are more distracted and executively mm. dysfunctional, mm. uh, I find that there, there, the invention requires you to pause, step back and connect all the things that you have inquired about yeah. or have understood. And I feel there's not enough time left or they don't afford that time. So then yeah. now they are completely in the consumer consumption mode. Yeah. That's where invention doesn't happen. Invention is really creating something when you're doing nothing. I, I mean, I'm sure you're right. And it's a super interesting thing to think about, but I suppose the point is there are different ways to use a computer, right? I've one way is yes. this empty, yes. awful thing I do sometimes where you just browse. I don't know what I'm browsing handbags <laughs> or something or, you know, like I said, Tudor history. I don't know. Whatever it is, it's kind of. Um, but uh, but on the other hand, kids also can. Uh, my my former students and I are collaborating on a new project that involves getting kids to create comic strips. There are all kinds of ways that kids invent and and build things and make things online. Now, maybe that's something. Maybe there are researchers looking at this already, or teachers who are thinking about this in their classroom you know, steering children towards more, um, more active ways of engaging with a, with mm. a computer. I, I imagine that would be a good thing, but you know, when you read, I mean, when you read, you're just lying there. It's your mind that's active, not your body. So I suppose that's the question. What can we do to make sure that when kids are online, it's, it's active, if not physically, at least certainly intellectually. Yeah. Well, this is, again, I can have ongoing uh, conversations with you for hours. I, I do want to <laughs> be mindful of uh, our yes. time. So I do want to ask you this again. I think, um, I don't know if this is the last question or not, but what is it then uh, that we can do to support the intellectual growth of our children? 
Uh, and uh, right. what can we, what can adults do to actually pick up on this <laughs> intellectual growth that is a lifelong intellectual growth? Uh, great question. The question of my life. Um, well, a couple of things. Uh, adults who are intellectually alive tend to encourage it in children. I mean, if they like children, if you don't like kids, you're not going to do that. But I know you yeah. should love children. Well, if you do, you do. If you don't, you don't. But for people <laughs> who, who like kids, um, being intellectually alive is the best thing you can do because, like so many things, like being a reader, like being a language user, like being kind, like being ethical, these things uh, rub off on, on the children that you spend time with, and that's true whether you're a parent or a teacher. Teachers I agree. have a huge influence, not only in what they do, but who they are as people. Um, so read, talk, be interested in things. Show how much you love not knowing something that you're then going to know. Oh, I uh, love that. And uh, show them the pleasure of uh, expecting to know something new or changing your mind. Um, one thing, I don't know who listens or watches your podcast. One thing I always warn against is certain kinds of parents who are eager to improve their child in every single way, hear this kind of conversation and they think of the new lessons they're going to engage. With their children yes. with. I'm going to talk about an idea every night at dinner. I'm going to use the word idea six times a day. Don't do that, please. Um, don't make <laughs> this into a chore. Uh, here's what I would end with. Um, so most children, most typically developing children, are, are born loving to use their minds. It's oh. what they live for, uh, to think about things, to ask about things, to solve problems. It, it doesn't have to be taught to them. It's what they want to do. So if you remember that, then you can, uh, rather than imposing something new on them, a new skill, a new accomplishment, a new thing to get good at, uh, you can remember that this is can be the greatest pleasure in life to sit around, do nothing, talk about ideas, listen to one another, mull things over, uh, ma imagine new realities. Um, and it's a it'll be way more fun for you and your child or you and your student if you think about it in that way. And I would just end by saying and periodically just listen, just mm. observe. Um, so that you have a better sense of what your kid is thinking about. I'll stop there. I love that. You know, you remind me of of uh, our sage, uh, <laughs> Mr. Rogers. You know what? You know what he said uh, to this ophthalmologist. If I'm, I remember my story correctly, that this ophthalmologist wrote a little uh, chapter or something uh, instructions how to. And they went to Mr. Rogers and asked, like, how do we get children to be, uh, co I don't know, cooperative or engaged in their eye exam? So what in, what do you have in mind? Like, we want some instructions to, and, and so he says, um, so he takes all the things that they had written, put a line through it, canceled it and said, just remember you were a child once, oh you know? God, it's so great. It's great. <laughs> so it, to me, I think what you're saying is, I think people are so not in touch with their own um, little <laughs> curious minds and I'm not faulting people for it, but I think they may think I'm, or even to call yourself, I'm not creative or I'm not a thinker or whatever it is. Mm. Um, I, I am, I am your ideal candidate. I am so curious about the world. I'm, I'm, I love exploring. I love to know I'm interested in people. I think that to me is a, one of the source of great curiosity for me, how people think and be, um, I have five patents. I'm an inventor in that way, which is formal way of like kind of sealing the deal for your invention. But as we end, um, I do want to ask you about your own um, innovative thinking. I see your research is very creative, the way you investigate um, uh, uh, how children think creatively. Um, how do you see that influence your personal life? Oh, what a great question. Um... And no one's ever asked me that question. Oh, I'm uh, so happy, yes. Well, uh, like you, I'm very obsessed with cooking um, as so and eating. So um, <laughs> yes. yeah, we spend a lot of time in our family. In fact, there's a wonderful book written by an Indian author. I forget her name. I think the book is called Shards of Glass, 
where she talks about her family in India sitting around on hot days. They eat breakfast and then they spend from breakfast to lunch talking about what they're going to eat for lunch. And that's my family. That's my yes. family. So, <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> and we're not Indian, but that's what we do. Um, but I guess I would say this is a, bo- a slightly less fun, colorful answer than the food part. You know, my invention is tends to be intellectual. I'm not I'm not well coordinated. I have very pe- bad visual skills. I'm not artistic in that sense. Uh but I like to play with ideas and I, I like to put together sentences and I like to develop arguments. Um and the one other way in which invention has served me well is in teaching. You know, so the thing I really love to do is constantly come up with a new way of teaching getting not teaching getting someone to learn something uh asking a better question that. coming up with a good activity thinking of a good paper assignment and i'm not always good at it but i like to do it so yeah well we have certainly benefited from your creativity and your incredible commitment to continue to invent because teachers need this kind of uh you know at the end of the rainbow for example is such a great book that talks about actually how to go yeah. about engaging in the classroom. So yeah. uh, we will be listing all these amazing uh, contributions. Uh, Susan, thank you for being here with us today. Oh, thank you so much. So much fun to talk to you. Absolutely. So that's all the time we have, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. And as you can see, these are important conversations uh, for us to have, uh, particularly with knowledgeable, incredibly qualified and highly passionate experts yeah. with their unique perspective and Um, So continue to tune in, share this if you like it and um, leave us a comment. Uh, You can always uh, reach out to me uh, by email and uh, thanks again for tuning in. Until then, have fun. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. <laughs>